Good morning. I'm Daniel Van Cleve. I'm the young adult pastor here. Grateful to our pastor, Dr. Danny Forshe, for running and performing and, and working in an Iron Man yesterday. How about that? I don't know what you call that thing, but he swam, he, he completed it. He swam two miles, biked 112 miles, and ran uh, 26.2 miles plus, and he finished. And so we're excited for him. And um, that gives me the opportunity to herald God's Word this morning. And so I'm thrilled um, to stand and honored, humbled to stand here in his pulpit and share with you a word that um, God has been cultivated in me for over 20 years. And so we're going to move fast this morning. And so I hope you brought your listening ears. Hey, I want us to pray first. Um, I want us to lean into God. I, I'm often convinced that we can come to the table and we cannot pick up what He has for us if we're not attuned to what He's saying and not responsive to what He's saying. And so I want to share, um, I want us to pray. I want to share a story that I read uh, some time back of a father and a son this father and this little boy, during World War II, um, they were hunkered down in a, in a building that had taken bombs and the building was falling apart. And so the father turned to his little son and said, we've got to get out of here. The roof's caving in, walls are falling in, it's not safe. So they ran out into the front of the building and, and gunfire, they're, they're in the battle. This, this village is being bombed and their troops are on the ground and and, and the closest thing and the safest thing that the father discerned that for, for security for he and his son was a hole, an old bombshell that had gone off in, in, the, in the yard. And so he ran towards this, bomb, this, this crater in the ground and he jumped in this crater. And just as he jumped in the crater, his son turned loose of his hand. And the father lands in the crater and looks up and says, son, jump. And the son looks over the hole and he says, Father, I cannot see you. It was dark. The shadow over the hole, he couldn't see a thing. He said, Father, I cannot see you. And the father responded. He says, Son, I can see you. And I've got my arms stretched out and I'm waiting to catch you. Jump. I've got you. And the little boy leaned over the hole. And because he trusted his father, and because he heard and responded to his father, he was safe. He fell into the hole, into his father's arms. And this morning, I want to challenge you as I pray that you would pray for yourself. And that you would pray, this is a selfish prayer and it's a good prayer. Pray for yourself and ask the Lord to speak to you. I want you to lean over that hole and listen to his voice and do what he tells you to do. Would you this morning, would you do that? Instead of coming and hearing a message and walking out the door the same, allow the word of God to permeate our hearts and to change our lives. Take a step of faith. Take a fall into his arms. So as I pray, pray something simple like, God, speak to me. God, I need you. Maybe your life has been bombarded this week. Maybe it's crumbling around you. Maybe you're in a building. And, and, and your house is just coming. It feels like it's falling apart. And God is saying, take my hand. Let's hear him this morning. Let's take his hand. And let's go out and let's be obedient to him. So as I pray, you pray because the heart, my, my prayer for you is not as effective as, as your heart of prayer in you. And so let's lean into the Lord. Pray with me. Lord God, as we um, listen to you this morning, I pray that each and every one of us would submit to your voice, submit to your leadership as you speak to us, be profound in our lives. God, I pray that we would take great risk, not following what our eyes tell us, but following your voice and submitting to that. Be large and in charge as we hear you. May we respond with, yes, Lord, to your love letters um, to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, um, turn with me to Psalm 23. Uh, this, this psalm is an old, old Hebrew songbook. 
Psalm 23 is quite possibly the most recognized chapter passage in the Bible. It has been read to millions of people over several thousand years. The original audience to whom Psalm 23 was penned were a nomadic people. They understood shepherding. They knew outdoor life. And so we city slickers, we yuppies, right? We have to kind of lean into this passage a little strong and do some research to even touch, scratch the surface of what is here um, in this this Psalm 23. Psalm 23 was penned by the psalmist David, but more than that, it it was delivered to him by the, the God, Creator, the Holy Spirit delivered it to him as he penned it. These are the, the words of God that we are about to read this morning. Psalm 23 effectively proves that we have only touched who God really is, I think. We are going to see this morning his impeccable character, his sovereign control, and his unparalleled um, compassion for his sheep. So Psalm 23, pull your um, device out and open up your copy, and let's read. As we read, would you identify provisions? Look for things that the shepherd delivers to the sheep. The Word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, makes us, or makes believers rather, his sheep. Um, If I know two things about sheep this morning, I had to do a lot of research. I'm going to give you some shepherd talk. Again, we're going to move fast. I I had to really find out more. Sheep are, all I know is is the wool you see on the screen. I mean, they're fluffy. They're really cute. I know wool and I know lamb chops. Outside of that, I, I, I don't really know. You know, sheep are entirely outside of most Americans' experience, and I'm an American. So I did some re- research, and I found out sheep are not very intelligent. They are set in their ways, and their ways are minuscule, right? They're really small. You cannot teach a sheep anything. According to shepherds, they, a dog, you can teach a dog how to fetch. The circus can train a monkey or a tiger or an elephant. But what you will not see in a circus is a sheep because they cannot be trained. Um, why can't they be trained? Because sheep are dumb as a sack of rocks. That's just, that's the bottom line. According to research, this is super important to this passage, sheep are the only domesticated animal that cannot go wild. Did you know that? Shepherds tell us, research says sheep are the only domesticated animal. They cannot revert wild. A dog, a cat, um, you name it. What are your house pets? Pigs? Maybe you have a pig. I don't know. Birds? Cows? You can turn them loose, domesticate them, turn them loose into the wild. They'll get thin, but they will survive. Sheep? They'll get eaten. Um, Sheep are not um, independent. They would cease to exist without the shepherd. If you're taking notes, that would be a good note to write down. Sheep will cease to exist without the shepherd. The animal kingdom um, uh, did some research on this and uh, to see how sheep, what, what, how can they combat um, life, right? In the animal kingdom, there are four survival stances. There's fight, there's flight, there's posture, and then submit. Those four things. A cat, for example, a cat can fight, he can claw or bite. A cat can um, flight, 
He can run, climb, hide, right? A cat can posture. Have you ever seen a cat arch its back and hiss, putting up a posture? A cat can flee. They can run or they can surrender and quit. Sheep, what do they do? Well, for fight, they have no offensive or de defensive weapons, no feints, claws, shells, sprays, nothing. On the flip side, they do have about eight pounds of a Velcro-like substance all over their body, so you can pretty much grab them and throw them around and do anything that you want to them. They cannot fight. Sheep cannot fly. For starters, they're slow. Their eyesight is poor. Their hearing is worse. Their stamina is weak. Um, sheep can't even run, hardly run at all. They have no sense of direction. Best of all, they have an overactive startle reflex. And so one little scare, and they're going to run. And they can run, but they cannot hide because they blend into nothing. Posture. Dogs bark. Even the rattlesnake will rattle. What do sheep do? Meh. That's it. <laughs> Meh. That's all sheep can do. That's the, barn that's the barnyard equivalent of, please, please don't eat me. And that's... That's all they've got. Well, they do know one trick. They do know one thing. They know how to flock. Sheep know how to flock. There are two rules to their flocking. Shepherds have found that sheep know how to flock. The, the, the one, number one rule is find another sheep and get close to him. Second rule for flocking is once you find that other sheep and get close to him, don't bump into them. They do not like to be and to run beside each other. They want a little bit of space. That's flocking rules. That's all sheep have. That's their entire survival strategy. Please don't eat me. Eat little Joe. Little Joe is cuter and then run away. That's all they can do. Well, pull out your notes. I want to give you some blanks to fill in this morning, some things to take away. Um, the first thing we're going to see, um, also there's an app if you um, do not have a note sheet or didn't get one of those, you can jump on the app and fill in the blanks there as well. The point number one is the Lord, or He is not the shepherd of all sheep. He is not the shepherd of all sheep. Everyone is not the Lord's sheep. Yes, He is creator, but we're going to see this morning He's not Lord of all. He's not shepherd of all. Let's unpack the word Lord here. The word Lord is, is Yahweh in the Hebrew, and it, it serves as the one and only true God. If He is my Lord, I am His subject. If He is my Lord, I am His King. Um, this word is used as primarily as God, creator of all. He is the God creator of all. This, this name of God was so powerful and so reverent to the Hebrew people that they would not even mention His name. They said Hashem. They just said the name out of reverence and consideration for Him. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, know that the Lord God Himself is God. He is the one who made us. We are His sheep and the sheep of His pasture. The next word I want us to unpack is my. This is a possessive adjective. He does not say the Lord is a shepherd. He says the Lord is my shepherd. This is huge, and the whole passage hinges on this word. He is my shepherd. He's not a shepherd. When I was a little boy, I was riding down Dawson. I lived in Dawson, Georgia, riding down Main Street, and I saw this bicycle in the window of the general store. And I pointed and I nudged my brother. I said, David, look, look at that bicycle. Sometime later, we're walking down the sidewalk. And I said, would you look at that bicycle? That is a nice bicycle. Then one day I went in the general store and I, and I touched the bicycle and I told the clerk, that is a nice bicycle. I like that bicycle. Well, as you can probably figure out, one day that bicycle became my bicycle. And I rode that bicycle home. And from then on, I never said, look at a bicycle or look at that bicycle. I said, look at my bicycle. This is my, I rode up to my friends. I said, do you like my bike? I didn't ride up and said, do you like a bike? It's mine, possessive. And this is what the Lord is telling us this morning. He, my sheep, the word a, the word a indicates admiration. There's no personal covenant. 
but my indicates ownership. The, the shepherd owns the sheep. 1 Corinthians uh, 6.20 says that we were bought with a price, therefore we are to glorify God in our bodies. The my indicates relationship, totally submissive to Him, both stated and implied and in waiting. The my also uh, shows belonging. We have been ear tagged and branded by the shepherd, and we belong to the shepherd. We're going to see that shepherd is Jesus. We're going to see this morning, Creator God, Jesus the Lord is our shepherd. So the word shepherd here is often spoke of um, in, in the Bible as the shepherd of Israel. Um, you see this in Psalm 28, 9, Psalm 77, 20, Psalm 78, 52. And Ezekiel 34, verse 11 through 16, speaks of this shepherd of Israel. Isaiah 40, the Word of God says in Isaiah 40, verse 11, that this shepherd is coming. He is a coming Messiah to come and to die for his sheep, for people, right? And then Jesus came, and he did so, and he identifies himself as that expected shepherd the good shepherd. In John 14, 6, the Word of God says, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He is also referred to as the great shepherd in Hebrews 13, 20, and the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5, 4. The Word of God says in John 10, 11, Jesus spoke, said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Big massive question for us this morning, very important question, are you his sheep? Um, I've had people tell me before, um, I'm his sheep because my grandpa was a good man or because I was a good man or because I joined the church or because I went through baptism waters or because all these things, but there's only one reason that you are his sheep. There's only re one reason that I am his sheep. Romans 10, 9 explains that if I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart, the locus of my being, if I confess and believe, I will be saved. And that salvific word, that, that process makes me His sheep. So everything we are about to see, we're going to run through all these beautiful provisions that the shepherd offers sheep, none of those apply to us unless we are His sheep. All these beautiful things, we cannot expect them because of that word, my. He's my shepherd. Is He your shepherd? Are you His sheep this morning? Please answer that question in your heart. The second point we're going to see is really amazing. The shepherd furnishes everything for his sheep. Man, you got to see this. Sheep, as we mentioned, are the only domesticated animal that cannot revert wild. They cannot go wild. They are totally dependent on the shepherd. Write this down if you're taking notes. The level to which I'm shepherded, the level to which I'm shepherded coincides with the magnitude of my blessing. The level to which I am shepherded coincides with the magnitude of my blessing. Number one, the blank there is provides. He provides. Verse 1, he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He does not say, I have all I want, okay? He says, I shall not want. It's not lacking of provision. He has supplied the need, so there's no, there's no want there. Verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, I'm not a Hebrew guy. Um, I'm going to botch this. But the Hebrew phrase, or the Hebrew verse for verse 2 says, Benava um, rabbits nigh, which is basically in the pasture of grass stretched out me. In a pasture of grass, I'm stretched out. So what is that? How does that? How do, how do we get? I shall not want. Well, shepherd talk. You got to know this. Um, the shepherds tell us that sheep will not lay down. If, if four things are present. If fear, if they're afraid, they will not lay down. Number two, if there's friction amongst the flock, they will not lay down. Sheep will also not lay down if they're hungry, so they've got to be fed. 
and sheep will not lay down if there are flies annoying them. So what we know here when he says these sheep are stretched out, they're in the recliner. They're hanging out in the field with lush grass in the recliner. What we know this is, what we can take away here is that they are satisfied in the provision and the caretaking of the shepherd. He has taken care of them. Sheep who are satisfied in his caretaking. Donald uh, Barnhouse wrote this. I'm going to read his quote. It's really cool. Couldn't say it better. Donald Barnhouse says, a shepherd who had spent many years with flocks on the hills of Scotland Ask me if I've ever seen a sheep eat while lying down. When I confessed that I had not, he told me that no one had ever seen a sheep eat lying down. If a sheep is lying down, he continued, there may be a lovely tuft of grass within an inch of her nose, but she will not eat it. She will scramble to her feet, stand up, lean over and eat the grass that was much easier to reach before. Thus, when the Lord, our shepherd, my shepherd, makes us lie down in green pastures, that means we have so much we just can't take any more. We are beside the still waters. He has satisfied our thirst." End quote. Write this down. Sheep who are satisfied in the provision and caretaking of the shepherd will rest. Sheep that are satisfied in the provision and the caretaking of the shepherd will rest. He provides that for us. Verse 5 talks about a provision, this feast in the presence of our enemies. Now, what do we take away from this? I, I think there's a couple of ideas, but for me, it, it, it seems to be that that the shepherd is providing this feast, which is a, a, an abundance, but the enemy is still there, right? The enemy is still there. What does that tell me? It tells me that God is not going to remove the enemies from my circle. He's not going to do it. We can see that in Job 1. The enemy is roaming the earth, seeking who he can devour, right? Who's that enemy? Satan. He is, he's doing work. So God does not promise the elimination of the enemy. Someone that tells you that is not taking God's Word, and they're not, read, they're not reading this and studying the Word of God. He promises to be with us, and that leads us to point number two. He is present. The shepherd is present. Wow, God is always present as our shepherd. He makes us lie down in green pastures. I read a story about a shepherd that went inside to take a nap. It was on a cool night. And he didn't want to stay out there with the sheep. And so he left several hundred sheep. And in the middle of the night, he could hear a rustling and something going on out there just beyond his bedroom window. And he ran outside and he could see in the, in the, in the moonlight sheep laying on the ground. And they were running. Others were running. And, the, and there was a wolf in the pasture and he was ripping them apart. And wolves won't just kill one sheep. Uh, often they, it, they do it for sport, and they'll kill every sheep in the entire place. And so just by walking out there, his presence, the wolf left. But that wasn't the end of the loss, because over the next couple of days, uh, uh, sheep continued to die. Fear began to grip them. Sheep need rest. Sheep need nourishment. And the shepherd noticed his sheep were not sleeping. They were not eating. They were not drinking. And so the shepherd had to get his mat in the middle of the night, two or three days later, and he, he took his mat up in and and, and his sleeping bag, and he went out to the middle of the pasture, and he set up, he set up a little camp and stuck his staff into the ground, and, and he, began to, he began to just be visible to his sheep. And one by one, they started eating. They started drinking. And then before you know it, time passed, and all the sheep were laying down around him. The presence of the shepherd brings peace, brings calm. God brings that for us. Um, I don't watch much TV. Um, there's a couple of shows I like. One of my favorite shows, I'll say my favorite show, um, because I, uh, my, some of my family will watch Undercover Boss with me. Uh, not, they won't always watch Sanford and Son with me, so I have to, you know, I had to grab something a little more modern. But anyway, I'm stuck in the 70s. So, 
If you've seen Undercover Boss, the CEO or the owner of the company will disguise himself and he will sneak in uh, under the radar and, and, and he will begin to engage his employees and ask questions and just do life with them. I love it because they always end with revealing. He reveals himself and says, oh, by the way, that guy you told all that stuff, uh, that, that, that was me. I, I'm your boss and I own it, the whole company. And, and what, 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 it, what this show shows me is I love to see the compassion of, of, the, of the, the honor of the company, but it also shows me that people will say um, some unfiltered things when they don't know who is with them. Sheep will do things they will not do if the shepherd is with them. And for me, a big takeaway for me this morning is to know that the shepherd is with me. God is with me. Matthew, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 28 in verse 20, he says, I am with you always, even to the end of age. God is with his sheep. Hebrews 13, 8 says, I will never leave you or forsake you. God is not going to get up because of my stupidity. He is not going to take off and leave me. He is with me. God promises to guide us as his shepherd. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, if I trust him, if I will fall into his arms, he will guide me. If I quit leaning to what it seems like or what it feels like to me, the shepherd takes me places I cannot go by myself. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, that he is greater than he that's in the world. The enemy that's roaming, feel like he's just crushing you at times, God is greater And instead of turning to Facebook and posting a rant, or instead of calling that best friend, the first thing we should do as Christians, as his sheep, is to lean into him right where we are and say, God, I need you. God, help me. God, your promises are true. I know you've never failed me. And in this moment, I feel this, I feel that. And let the shepherd nourish us, be with him. He will never leave us or forsake us. Number three, he leads. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I'm going to show you a video on the screen here of a couple of people trying to call sheep, but the shepherd succeeds. When all these others fail, watch what the sheep do and watch how they respond to him. Sheep respond to the shepherd's voice. Um, I, I love this. I love that. And I think about how many times God speaks to me. Am I that responsive? You know, the others try. They didn't, sheep wouldn't even look up. But when they heard the shepherd's voice, his sheep know his voice. And they hear him and they follow. He is a great, incredible leader. Verse 2, he leads me beside peaceful streams. Shepherd talk here, um, you've got to know that sheep will not drink from rapids. If the water's rough, they will not drink from it. Um, You have to be careful giving water to sheep because sheep have been known to drown in as little as two inches of water because they forget to lift their head, okay? I know it's hilarious, but it's also crazy because that is a waste of lamb chops. So they don't lift their head and all of a sudden it's like, ploop. Well, down down went Ralph. He's gone. We lost him. 
Um, he forgot he was drinking and he just stumbled over. We, sheep need the shepherd. Um, verse, verse 2 tells us he leads us beside peaceful streams. Verse 3, he guides us along the right paths. Um, this is crucial. Guides us along the right paths. Sheep will tear up property. I don't have time to get into a lot of it, but sheep have to be moved from plot to plot. You cannot just leave them in the same place because they will annihilate property. Uh, they'll tear it to bits and eventually it will be no good. So shepherds have to move them and take them to the right paths. And it says in verse three that it brings honor to his name. Brings honor to the sheep's name or brings honor to the Lord's name. Uh Uh-oh, have a little purpose here. The purpose of sheep are not to glorify themselves. The purpose of shepherding, his shepherding, is to bring glory and honor to the shepherd. God created us to bring honor and glory to him. My life does not belong to me, and he moves me, and and, and I am to be satisfied in in that leadership. Number four, he comforts. I love this part. Um, This is my favorite verse. Um, Verse 3 says, He renews my strength. Your version might say, He restores my soul. In Hebrew, this is a picture of a shepherd turning a cast sheep upright. Being cast is the number one, shepherds tell us it's the number one killer of sheep. I have a picture on the screen of what this looks like. This is what a cast sheep looks like. This sheep is alive, but he cannot turn over because he is cast. He falls over on his back, and I was going to show you a video of it, but it it about made me cry, and I figured you guys would, some of you would sob and and probably uncontrollably lose yourself. So this, um, this, this image is still, but this is what hours and hours and hours, sometimes in just a few hours. When a sheep is cast, their legs are straight up, they, they, the fluid on their lungs causes them to asphyxiate or to choke on their, their air, and they die. In a couple of hours, as long as a, a couple of maybe a day or two, some can last that long, but they kick and they frail around and, and, and just in desperation and depression. It's a horrible, horrible thing. But the only thing that can sh- save this sheep like a turtle on their back, or worse. The only thing that can save this sheep is the shepherd. And what he does is he comes up and he turns that sheep over. You would think he'd put him on his feet and the sheep will run off, but he can't. The sheep does not have use of his legs anymore because the blood flow has left its legs and he can't move. And so he restores him. He grabs him. I love this imagery. He takes him in his arms and he begins to massage his legs. And the shepherd says he starts talking to him because his voice is soothing. And he says, it's going to be okay. I've got you. It's going to be all right. You, you survived this. It's good. It's good. And he talks him. He talks him off that ledge. And, and in just maybe a couple of hours, it, he'll set him down and that sheep runs off and he's fine. Cast is the number one killer. Being cast is the number one killer of sheep. David said in Psalm 43, he uses the term, why are you downcast, O my soul? This is what he's saying. Why am I on my back? I, I, why, why do I feel like I have no hope? There are two things that bring, um, I, two things that are most valuable to sheep. And I found it interesting that those two things cause sheep to become cast the most. Um, their, their thickness of their wool, often the, the fatter the sheep are, the two things that bring them value are the one thing, are the two things that can cause them to become cast easiest. I think we can learn things um, from this. Um, Proverbs eighteen fourteen, he says, a crushed spirit who can bear. Sheep become depressed. We can become depressed. When we, when we fall or when we get on it, when we stumble over, you know, sheep do not have to be, they don't have to fall over to become cast. Um, they, can be, they can become cast on a flat piece of pasture land. Any situation um, can rise and they can become cast. We all, need, we all need a shepherd to turn us up right. We need the Word of God to speak into our lives. And that's what I love about Transform, our recovery and renewal program. 
that we have here at Greatness Baptist Church. Many of you probably don't know about it. It meets on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Um, it, it, we, we are, it's not just for addicts or for a drug addict or an alcoholic. It's for, it's for depressed people. It's for people that, just like you and I, that, that can from time to time have a life-dominating sin. And what we need is the Word of God. What we need is God, the truths of God's Word. And so maybe you're interested in that. We're going to be meeting through the summer on, on Wednesday nights as well. You can go to ghbc.org slash recovery, register for a $5 meal, and jump on board with that. Uh, we'd love, love to have you. He comforts us. Um, number five, He protects us. God protects us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. If you're taking notes, I want you to notice and write down that we're walking through the valley. Walk through. Don't set up camp. If you write in your Bible, put down there, don't set up camp in the valley. The valley is not a camping ground. It is a place to get through. And the beautiful thing about it is, is on the other side of the valley is a mountain. And we need to just lift our head and we need to know the shepherd's with us and he's guiding us and he's protecting us in that vulnerable place and he's walking us through that. He calls it the shadow of death. Why? Because a shadow can't hurt you. Just like death cannot hurt me. Death cannot hurt us as his sheep. As a matter of fact, I would propose that death does not exist. I think if you even look up in the dictionary, you'll see that death is the ceasing of life to exist. And, and when this earth suit, my body, is laid in a six-foot hole probably in Crown Hill Cemetery in Albany, Georgia, I'm not dead. I'm not dying. I live. I live like I've never lived before. Because my spirit, my soul goes on to be with the Lord. To be absent with the body, this earth suit is to be present with the Lord. That is a time of rejoicing. I look forward to it. First Corinthians, um, what is it? First Corinthians 15, 55 says, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The answer is it does not exist because Jesus died for it. And he gave us hope. We have hope. And so death, when death has no sting, it's not a thing. It just isn't. And we go through this valley, we go through the shadow. Wow, I wish we could spend more time on that. Latter part of verse 4, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, I have a pathetic staff and a pathetic rod. Um, this is not a staff, but this is the best I could do. Um, this, this is a cane, but it, a staff is about this tall. Most of you know what a shepherd's staff is. I'm a, I'm a city slicker, so I don't have a staff laying around the yard. But the staff um, represents a couple of things. Um, it, it represents the leadership of the shepherd. It represents, it kind of identifies him. Often the shepherd will tap his sheep on the back as he's walking with them. He just nudges them, loves on them. It, it'll also reach to places that it's, it's probably six, seven feet tall. So it'll reach places that um, normally a shepherd wouldn't be able to go. But it's an identifying um, uh, symbol for, for the, the, the shepherd. So the rod, this is my favorite thing. Um, the, the rod, this is a Arungu. I bought this in Kenya. The Maasai tote this thing. Um, the rod is, is, is a very good weapon for the shepherd, and it would look something like this. Um, this rod represents discipline, represents defense. Um, it's a lot like, I think, parallels with God's Word. It gives protection. Um, the shepherd will use it to examine the sheep. Sometimes he'll run the, run the rod through its fur and examine and make sure he's okay. Discipline. Um, I read an article where a shepherd had a sheep that continued to, to run away over and over and over again, and he was afraid because um, some of his other sheep started going with him, started leading him that way. And so the shepherd took his rod, some of you need to put your fingers in your ears, and he took and he, and he broke his arm, he broke his leg. But sheep don't have arms, do they? <laughs> That's hilarious. Somebody tweet that. He broke his leg. He broke his leg. And you say, that's horrible. But guess what he did after that? He took that sheep in his arms 
and he began to talk, he, he cast, he put that sheep in a, in a splint and he began to, to do life with that sheep. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, he held that sheep and he comforted that sheep and his love. But the rod represents all those things. Um, read a story about uh, a sheep, sheep that recognized the staff. And one day they became startled and they looked around and there was no staff. And, and the, sh the shepherd had gone inside to take care of some business real quick inside the little, little cottage just for a few minutes. And when he came out, he noticed all of his sheep were gone. He had a thousand sheep out there on the edge of a, 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 of a cliff grazing. And he comes out and they're all gone. Well, a witness said that they saw somebody, something startled them and they took off. They didn't see the shepherd. And so they ran and they followed each other right off a cliff. 500 foot cliff, 1,000 sheep off the cliff. Not all is lost, hang on. Only 393 of them died. Why? Well, I can't wait to tell you. About 600 of the brothers survived because 393 made a real soft, nice landing pad for them. And so they just kind of hit and said, oh, that was fun. I, if it was me, I would have said, y'all don't go anywhere. And I'd have gone back up there and jumped off again just to experience it. But um, the shepherd brings protection. His staff identifies him and, and often can, can, can pause that alarm. He provides in war. Uh, we saw in verse 5, preparing in the presence of the enemy. The enemy's always present. Last point, the shepherd loves his sheep. More than a manager... More than an overlord, God is love. It's the essence of who He is. It is not a characteristic of God. Love is not. It is who God is. He cannot do anything but love. If God did it, it's love. That's who He is. Three things that we pick out just real quick. He cares for His sheep. Um, verse, verse 5, we wouldn't know what this meant unless we, we study shepherding. But he, he says, you anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. Dr. Philip Keller says that this is when a shepherd takes a, a resin-based olive oil and he rubs it on the snout of the sheep. He puts it on there so the flies, during a season, flies will climb into the snout of the sheep. And, and ultimately will kill them because that fly climbs into the snout and says, oh, this is a warm, comfortable place. And he lays an egg. The egg hatches. The larva comes out and the larva says, oh, this is a warm, comfortable place. And he climbs up into the brain of the sheep and, and will kill the sheep. Um, lots of sheep are lost. They're seen bashing their heads against something, trying to itch that, that scratch, and they can't just, um, they just don't survive. Um, very gross thing. So without the shepherd, this is a picture of our need for the shepherd. We have to have him. If you want to look at a real cool vo verse on anointing, look at Hebrews 1.9 later on in your, your, home, your homework there. It's one of my favorite verses. He safeguards his sheep. He blesses his sheep. Last part of verse 5, my cup overflows. What does that mean? What happens when the cup is overflowing? You've got too much, right? He's, he not only supplies our need, but he goes above and, and, and way beyond what we even need. Finally, um, and, and last, is he gives himself. He gives himself. John 10, Jesus said in his word, the Bible says, John 10, no one takes my life, I lay it down. No one took Jesus' life, he laid it down. Why did Jesus lay down his life? Isaiah 56, 3 says, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned to our own way, but it says the Lord laid on him, Jesus, the sin or the iniquity of us all. All of us as sheep have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that that sin, the benefit of that sin is death. My payment for my sin is death. There has to be death. Shed blood must happen. And so Jesus came. 
He came and willingly sacrificed himself. He walked to that altar, and he took that cross for me and you, and he died, and he, and he, and he didn't stay there. He, he was buried, and he rose on the third day, victorious. And God said, I'm satisfied. God said, I'm satisfied with the payment and the sacrifice that was made. Through Jesus, the great shepherd, he came and he died because we would not have hope without him. So that we, as the last verse says, surely goodness and mercy, unfailing love, will pursue me all the days of my life. I could not have that pursuit all the days of my life without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit without God bringing leadership in my life, without God bringing comfort in my life, without God bringing direction in my life, without God regenerating me, without God filling me, without God sealing me, without God gifting me, without God sanctifying me, and one day He will glorify me and He will give me a perfect body to reign with Him in eternity. I have these things because Jesus came and died. Somebody needs to hear that this morning morning, because Jesus is the only way that you will become His sheep this morning. And I think in a group this size, somebody here maybe needs to st- take that step. The, the, the prettiest and most amazing step you can possibly ever make is to give your life to Jesus. And in just a moment, I'm going to pray. But before we do, I want to I ask you a couple, a couple questions, just a few things. And we're going to open up a time, and in and, and just a moment I'm going to pray. We're going to open up a time that we call our altar time, where you can come and you can pray with a staff. You don't have to come forward to pray because he, he's, he's right there. You can talk to him where you're at. There's power in uniting. And so let us flock with you. Let us get with you and, and pray with you and, and talk through where you're at. Maybe you're struggling, maybe it's a financial situation and you just, you're, you're one of his sheep, but you just, you're just going through a hard time and you just need, some, you just need somebody to come alongside you and pray, pray God's provision over your life. We would love to do that. Maybe you've had a hard time sensing his presence and, and you're becoming startled and, and, f- and fear is gripping you. You need to be free from that. He didn't give you the spirit of fear. You need somebody to tell you tell you and take you to God's Word and just challenge you and pray with you. We want to be that for you. Maybe you're far from God this morning. You're one of His sheep, but but you're the one that He's he's pulled the rod out, and he's He's had to smack you a little bit to bring you back to Him. Would you come home this morning? Would you quit running? Would you? Follow his leadership. He wants to comfort you. Maybe you walked in depressed this morning. Life is rough. It's hard. And you, you, you come in and you're just dragging. You say, God, I just need you to help me. Would you just turn my life upright? Would you just reach in it? Would you grab me and would you just walk with me? Can I just hear your voice? God wants to be that shepherd to you this morning. And as I said just a moment ago, do you belong to him? Lastly, if, if you don't, I would challenge you to come forward, to take one of us by. I'm going to be right down here. Just come and say, hey, Daniel, dude, pastor, I, I'm that person. I need to be his sheep this morning. And I'll know what that means. I want to be his sheep. I want to belong to him. I, I've heard that he died on the cross for me, but I have never transferred my trust to him. Guys, it doesn't matter that you know all that stuff. If you've been seated here for 65 years and you know the gospel backwards and forward and can deliver it better than myself, guess what? All that's good and great, but salvation comes with a confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it is when one surrenders their life to Him and transfers their trust to Him. It's saying, God, I'm your sheep. That doesn't mean you don't have despair, and that doesn't mean you're not cast from time to time. That that means you belong to Him. Do you belong to Him this morning? If not, I'm going to pray, and our band's going to get in place, and we're going to ask you to respond to, to the Lord this morning. Bow with me. Father, thank you this morning. You are a great shepherd. Lord, you love us so much. 
Lord, you love us too much to leave us where we're at. And every single one of us this morning, we are in a conforming process. Some are under your leadership as your sheep. Others are under your leadership as your creation. And Lord, I ask this morning that you would make much of your story this morning in the hearts and lives of your people. And God, that we would be a people pleasing to you, that we would be a people that responds to you. And God, I pray for that person that's looking over a dark hole. I pray for that person this morning that's on their back. I pray for that person this morning that has a need that only you can do. And we've gone everywhere else, and it just is not working. I pray we would come to you, God, and I pray we would lean over and fall into your arms and let you be the God and the shepherd that you so desire to be. You take this time, Lord. These are your people. Move in our lives as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? And our, um, our staff's going to be at the front. We would love to pray with you, but you come and you move as God leads you this morning.